good afternoon. Thank you for making it back from lunch on time. I know that was tricky. So my name is Barbara Chamberlain. Um, uh, lo siento, pero uh, uh, hablo un poquito de español. Sí, a veces, uno, dos, tres, sí. Um, mucho gusto y gracias y estas palabras es fin. So uh, con tu permiso, um, I wish to use the lovely translators in the box. Let's everyone wave and say, hello, lovely translators in the box. So thank you for making me sound so intelligent. So you are making me sound so intelligent. See? 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 OK, I see. OK. Um, I am very sorry for a number of reasons that I cannot speak to you in Spanish. For starters, in los Estados Unidos, me llamo as Dr. Barbara Chamberlain. Pero in Bogota, me llamo as Dr. Barbara Chamberlain. See? ¿Sí? Todos más hermosas en Colombia. Todos. Everything's more beautiful here. So at least for one more day until I leave tomorrow to return to the United States, I get to be la Dr. Barbara Chamberlain. So gracias. Um, so two talks today. The first one, I'm going to try to teach you something. So this is about the user testing that we do at New Mexico State University and how we find out if the materials we develop are good for the audience. After, and then Darren's going to speak, and then after that, I'm going to try to just inspire you a little bit with some examples of games that really have changed things in my life. So come back for that if you'd like to. But for now, uh, let's get started. See? Ah, yes, yes. Okay. So the Learning Games Lab. I don't know where to stand, that it's easier. See, if I'm here, I block you. And if I'm here, I block you. So I don't know which of you I like better. It's, <laughs> you all seem so nice. I don't want to take sides. So I'll try to walk back and forth. So at least each of you get half the information half the time. <laughs> Okay, also, if possible, I would like a light on that. I try to speak in as many rooms with disco balls as possible, so that may be for later. Okay, uh, so uh, back to the topic at hand. The Learning Games Lab at New Mexico State University, we develop educational games, serious games. We take research at the university on a wide variety of topics, math science, agriculture, raising a family, and we try to help everyday normal people, like myself, use this information in their lives. We do it with videos, we do it with comic books, we do it with audio, we do it with podcasts, and we do it with games, which is one of my favorite areas. With games, it's the hardest, because game development is more complex in the production cycle. So these are some of the materials that we've developed. Now, the Learning Games Lab itself is actually a Pardon? Okay. It's their turn now. Uh, a physical space where we bring kids in to do testing for us. So we have kids in our game lab every day over the summer. They come and do different projects, and we have access to them. And then we bring them in about once a month throughout the year. Here's why. What I really should have called this talk is why I hate user testing. Because let's face it, it's a pain. It, none of us like it. If you, how, who here has done user testing? Did you enjoy it? No. How many of you here think you should do user testing, but it makes you do that? Yes. OK. Yeah. See, I, I feel like it just confirms stuff I already know, or it's such a hassle, and it's so much work. And I just I haven't wanted to deal with it. But boy, howdy, if you go through your game development cycle and then you find out there's a critical problem, the faces you make will be worse than that. So it's better to embrace it and to do it. And we've spent the past eight years working on new methods for user testing that will work for any game, any product really, kids, adults, it doesn't matter. And that's what I want to share with you. So now it's really why I no longer hate user testing. So I'm hoping I can do that for you. OK. You know, the problem with user testing is these two gentlemen. So Steve Jobs said, it's really hard to design products by focus groups. A lot of times, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And Henry Ford, who invented the automobile, said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And this is the problem we have with user testing. Often in this field, we think, 
I've got a brilliant idea, I've got a good team, I'm smart enough, I don't need user testing. But here's what I think. I don't believe that user testing removes design genius. You can have the most brilliant idea and the most beautiful game. There is nothing about the user testing process that's going to take that away. But you only have your own perspective. You don't know what it's like to be anybody else and play your game but you. You can't possibly know, and that's why it's so valuable. Okay. Testing is part of the process. I've put several terms along the bottom that's often used to refer to this. User testing, play testing, users as designers, formative testing, beta testing, I use those as well. But remember, it's part of the process. It's not the thing you do at the end, it's part of the process. Okay, here's the challenge. Generally speaking, people are not very good at saying why they like something. This is also true of children. But it's horrible. Adults can't do it. We aren't very good at it. And this is what's inherently very hard about user testing, is we ultimately want to put our product in front of someone and find out, do you like it? You can't. Here's why. Well, you can't ask him that anyway. Here's why. Here's what has to happen. For you to be able to tell me what you like, you have to go through several steps. First, you have to know you like it. Have you ever liked something and then gone back the next day and said, what was I thinking? That's horrible. Or you don't like it and then you come to love it. Or you look at something and you just don't even know how you feel. It's not you. Everybody here feels that way, right? It's hard. You have to know that you like it. You have to know how you feel about something. And you can't do it any more than the people you're working with. Don't expect them to do it if you can't do it, because we can't. We're horrible at it. Not only do you have to know you like it, you have to know why you like it. That's even harder. If I were to say, do you, do you like my outfit? You'd say, uh, yes, I do. Why? Yes, I do. It's, it's a lovely outfit. And I'd say, why do you like it? Yeah, I, is it the color? Is it, I don't, you know, does it remind you of something somebody else has worn before? Is it the jacket? Does it go well with the glitter ball? You know, what is it? I don't, I, what, what, I don't know. What do you do? So, you know what you do when I pressure you and I say, why do you like it? Why do you like it? Why do you like it? This is what you say. You say the first thing that you notice, right? Uh, it's your beautiful scarf. Yes, that's a lovely scarf. It's a lovely color for you, which may, it, it, not you, it's a lovely scarf. Really, it is. But that might not be why you like it. So your user has to be able to move beyond what they simply notice. And guess what they notice first in games? Any guesses? Graphics. Graphics, right. And I don't know if any of you have played the Wii, Wii Bowling. Right? I have spent hours playing Wii Bowling, and those guys, they don't even have arms, right? Art is not the most important thing, but it's what people notice. And you have to know that in user testing. The art might be beautiful, and your game might be horrible, and they might look at it because they notice it first, so they will mention it. You also have to be able to overcome influences. Do you like my outfit? <laughs> uh, me? Oh, we're well, getting glasses. Okay. <laughs> Whenever you ask somebody to give an opinion, they already know there is an expectation and they want to please you. Or they might really relish their role as a critic. <laughs> and they will tell you all sorts of things just because they can. We have biases and it's hard for us to get over that. And then finally, if you can do steps one through four, you have to be able to communicate it clearly. You have to be able to articulate it. You have to be able to say it. And I don't know about you, I spend a very fair amount of my time speaking to people and I still have trouble putting words into the form of a sentence that people can understand. Don't expect your users to do that. So, in addition to all of this that you have to do, I have to be able to understand free of my biases. I have to be able to hear what you say, know what you say. I have to be able to take it in and remove the filter of the biases I have in my own. What people in scarves, what, what do they know? I can't, I can't listen to people in scarves, right? Again, you're verily lovely. It's not you. But I have my own biases. We all have biases. So user testing is sort of, uh, sort of difficult right there. But don't worry. We can fix it. There's a way. Okay. So here's what you're going to do first. You're going to get your group together. Okay. This is the hardest part. So here's what I recommend. Do it just once. Get a group and then have them come back a lot. 
okay? Don't try to set up a test session and then set up a test session. So just get a group of people to your studio once a month and it's pizza night, okay? And if you have something to show them, great. And if you don't, give them pizza anyway with your best wishes, okay? Tell them to bring a friend. Whoever your target audience is, get a group together and get a mechanic where you have access to them regularly. And I'll tell you, they will be happy to do it because they feel honored to have been asked. Bring them in, have them for a pizza. Don't get too cozy. Don't go with them afterwards. You can't test with your friends, but have a reason for them to come regularly. You'll be surprised how inexpensively you can do that. Pizza buys a lot of goodwill or orepas or a chocolate. Okay, now here's what I recommend. Oh, I want to show you this first, perhaps. Okay, I want to show you a video which really encompasses why I. Uh... No sé, el pescado se ve bien. No me gusta el pescado. Estaba pescando en la costa de Alaska cuando mi perro saltó al agua y él estaba todo mojado. Y esto me recordó una canción acerca del perro de un hombre que murió y su camión dejó de funcionar. Y decía también algo acerca de un tren. Y aunque mi perro no murió y yo no tengo un camión porque yo estaba en un bote, pero esto me pone muy triste. Una vez escuché la canción de adelante para atrás para ver si el camión funcionaba y el perro no moría. Pero solo sonaba raro y yo seguí muy triste. ¿Tú has escuchado música norteña al revés? Ni idea. ¿De qué estás hablando? Pescado. Estoy hablando del pescado. Cuando me recuerda cuando mi perro murió, como en la película que vi, en la que aparece un muchacho de otra película. Fue graciosísimo. ¿Recuerdas? Acerca del espacio. Y había una mujer con pelo azul. Me reí tanto que la leche me salió por la nariz. O... Oh, um, alguien me está llamando. Yo no escucho un teléfono. En serio. Tengo que tomar esta llamada. Durante este tiempo, he hablado 25 palabras y él 175. Esto significa que por cada palabra mía, él habló 7 palabras. Él habló 7 veces más de lo que yo hablé. ¡Siete veces! Esto fue así. Yo, bla, él, bla, 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 bla. Yo, bla, él, bla, 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 bla. ¿Y te gusta el pescado? No me gusta. Le pregunté al último muchacho con quien salí acerca del pescado y él habló de camiones toda la noche. ¿Has salido con alguien que habla demasiado? ¿Pescado? Para nada. Oh, alguien me está llamando. Durante este tiempo yo hablé 36 palabras y él habló 6. Por cada 6 palabras que hablé, él solo habló una. Hablé 6 veces más de lo que él habló. ¡Seis veces! Esto fue así. Yo, bla, 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 bla. Él, bla, todo lo que quiero es un hombre que hable conmigo en una proporción de uno a uno. ¿Y te gusta el pescado? No me gusta el pescado. A mi compañero tampoco. ¿Y a ti? Me gusta el pescado. Por Dios, he tenido algunas malas citas últimamente. Qué curioso. Mi compañero dice lo mismo. ¿Tus citas hablan sobre el pescado? No, las tuyas sí. Un muchacho habló sobre pescado. Tenía un camión y escuchaba música norteña al revés. Mi compañero habla del pescado. Tiene un camión y escucha música norteña al revés. ¿Tuviste una cita con, tu con compañero? mi compañero? ¿Lo notaste? Hablamos la misma cantidad de palabras en proporción de uno a uno. Cierto. Hablamos de la misma cantidad de palabras en proporción de uno a uno. Pan. <laughs> Thank you. We just had that translated for Spanish for the United States Spanish. Did it translate okay? For Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. So this is a project we did for a series of animations we did for math for middle school students. And we were testing, there's two stories about user testing here. First, we were testing these the storyline with kids. Did it resonate? Did it make sense? Did they think it was funny? Was a date? enough that sixth grade students could think it was cool, but not enough it intimidated them. So we just put those graphics together just as a placeholder so the students could hear the script. We like to test early and often throughout. We just wanted them to hear it, see how they felt. They loved those graphics. Our studio, those, those are horrible. Our studio can do much better graphics than that. 
But the kids loved it so much, we kept it. And it has been one of our, our biggest hits from those animations. Now, the second thing that happened was we took the earlier version of this to a committee, and there's something else we'll do with a, an older group, with a, um, adults who watched it, who are the gatekeepers. And they watched it, and the original version of this was the girl going on a date. And she's talking and talking and talking and talking and talking, and the boy is like, ay, that's me. And we showed it to them, and I heard some of the women in the bathroom afterwards saying how offended they were, because it continued the stereotype of women being the ones to talk all the time. And that it hurt their feelings for everything they had fought for in women's rights to once again perpetuate the stereotype that the woman was the dominant talking person and the man was the passive victim. <laughs> and we thought, that's the whole point. How are we going to redo this? But you see, we were able to do it immediately. We were able to set up three dates, so neither boy nor girl are in the wrong. Everybody was happy, and we knew it was effective for two reasons. One, we did some testing. Did they understand what a ratio was? You notice we never said, this is what a ratio is, but you get a pretty good sense of it. But the other neat thing happened in our games lab. We have the kids all day. We show them this. We talk about it in the morning. They still have six hours of stuff to do. And what we found was all day, whenever there would be a natural lull or stopping conversation, da -da 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 -da. Somebody would always say, bread, bun, oh. And we knew we had something there. So I didn't have to ask the kids if they like it. I knew by observing their behavior. Here's my recommendation on how you can move forward as well. OK, number one, working with users shouldn't be a test of success, but part of the design process. Don't look at testing of this, yes or no. This, like it, don't like it. No, 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 that's not what it's about. Testing is about pirates, ninjas, how do you feel? Where do you go to for information? What games do you currently like? Testing is about understanding your audience. It is not always a test of one product's effectiveness. If you look at it that way, it frees you up tremendously because you don't have to have something ready on time for the testers to look at it. They can just review it where it is. Number two. This is a tricky one. Don't ask the question you want answered. Huh? What? I'm crazy. Estoy loco, no? Why do you ask the question? Well, how do I find out the question answered? Here's the problem. I, I just gave you seven points earlier about why people can't respond to things easily, right? It's very hard to know that. What you want to know about your game is, is this good or is it not good? Are the graphics good or are they not good? It's very difficult for people to articulate that. So you write down what you want to know and then get very creative about how to find it out. I'm going to give you some examples of this. But you can certainly do it through observation by just having them play and just watch. Just watch. See what they say to each other. By discussion in a large group, prompting some things, and I have some help with that. A creative activity. I'd like you to draw for me what you think we should do after this level. That, not because you want to know what the next level is like, but because when you ask them to draw what the next level of the game is like, you will get a very clear idea about what they like in this level and what doesn't work. Um, other questions you can ask them, and I've got some examples of those. Here's some examples of some testing we did uh, for a project called Don't Be Gross to help kids learn when to wash their hands. Did everybody wash their hands? I have a camera downstairs. I can find out. I don't have a camera downstairs. OK, so we um, put all of these graphics in front of the kids. And we asked them to tell us which set they liked better, of the water ninja and the kid and the dog. And it was split. Everybody had a different one. And then they were talking. And they were arguing with it. Oh, it was such frustration. And then what we realized, we don't need to know which of these graphics they liked best. We need to know if there are any of these graphics that they hated. That was what we needed to know. Because I don't care if they love the graphic style. I just don't want them to look at it and hate the graphic style so much they can't hear what's being said. So we changed it. Instead of saying, which do you like better, we put all of them around the room and we gave everybody an opportunity to vote about which one they hated the most. And then we asked them to tell us why. And then we were able to go back to the style we ultimately went with because of the things that they told us. Don't ask them to pick. It's not fair. Ask them to describe what they see. 
Okay? This is the question we always want to know. Anybody know the major problem with that question? See? They don't know. Yes, that's right. How many answers to this question are there? Yes or no? See? See or no? See, I do speak Spanish. Okay, okay. See or no? Do you like it? There's only two answers to that question. If they say yes, you don't have anything to work from. If they say no, you don't have anything to work from. <laughs> the biggest curse is starting with yes or no questions. Now, in this same family are all of these other ones. Is it too hard? Do you hate it? Is it boring, hip? Is it too juvenile? Can you figure out how to work it? Is it too hard? Are you learning what you're supposed to? I'm sorry, lo siento, I know, okay. Um, these are the questions we wanna know and these are the questions you can't ask. These are wonderful things to learn. Find a back door to find the answers to them, okay? Ask the right questions. I'm gonna give you some examples of those. Okay, number one, any question that starts with do or is, forgive me, you can find a, an alternative for that. Any question that starts with do or is, drop them from your vocabulary right now because those are gonna be a yes or no question, okay? And instead of that, try this magical number, tell me. Explain how these are wonderful words to start. Now, this is obvious. I know. I can tell you don't ask yes or no questions. You're going to be like, don't ask yes or no questions. I've got it. I've got it. And then you're going to get some yes or te user testers in, and you are going to ask a yes or no question because it is human nature. I do it all the time. I do it all the time. It is so hard to not do that. So here's what you do. You write it down. You're going to write it down. They're going to be yes or no questions. Then you're going to give sample examples of all of those questions and you're going to have them on a clipboard. Because when you're in a room and you're working with people and you kind of, you're going to default to the yes or no questions. And you're going to say, do you, uh, 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 uh-huh, tell me how you feel. <laughs> you will be happy if you write them down. You may not use them all, but you will be happy you have them written down and you can catch that to start getting richer feedback from them. Okay, this is big. Treat them as advisors, not subjects. Because you are not making a game for this person right here, right? You cannot possibly have everybody in the world who's gonna play your game. Plus, he's got a lot of other stuff going on. I mean, you're very nice, but he's got other stuff going on. And he's gonna be a lot more talkative if instead of me putting him on the spot and saying, what do you think about this? If I say, tell me about your friends. What do they do? This is extremely powerful with kids. If you want to know if this game is age appropriate, you never say, is this the right age for you? You say, what age do you think this game was made for? And then you'll find out the answer to that question. Would you recommend this to your friends? How would your sisters or your brothers look at this? I want you to think in your mind of someone who plays a lot of games. Do you know someone who plays a lot of games? Tell me how he would feel about this level I just showed you. That's very powerful. And it gives your advisees a lot of power because instead of being put on the spot for their own opinions, they get to analyze other people. And we all like doing that, right? Treat them as advisors, not subjects. What age is this game for? Think of your friends who will like it. What kind of games and kids in your class or in your peer circle play? Okay, number three, I'm sorry, I just, I, my clicker doesn't work, so now you all can't read any of the slides. Get copies of their notes, you'll be fine. Okay, uh, coordinate multiple ways of getting feedback. This is my favorite, and this is what we spent most of our time doing. We do a number of ways. We certainly do observations. We'll do one-on-two -on -two observations where two kids are playing and we have one person just watching. We'll have no more than one-on-four. It's impossible for one person to really adequately watch four people playing. We'll do one-on-one -on -one observations if it's particularly tricky. So we certainly do observations. We also do writing activities, design activities. So here's some examples. I love this video closet. This is a corner of our learning games lab that's just a shower door. And if you go Inside, there's a video camera and a whiteboard on the wall. We write the question on the whiteboard and we say, when you're ready, go into the closet and give us your feedback. This is why it's powerful. You avoid groupthink. The people who actually like to think before they talk, I don't know what that's like, but evidently some people do that. 
And if you partner this with some group discussion where you've already got them thinking and their juice is flowing, then they're able to go in and very often clearly articulate what it is they wanted to tell you. Have you ever been asked to write something down? Maybe you have a class and your professor wants feedback and you're telling your friends afterwards, oh, the professor needs to do this and this and this is what was wrong and I was thinking about this and if you would just do this, more people would be And then you have to write it down in a written evaluation and you're like, oh, SWN. Nobody likes to write it out. Give them a chance to talk it out. And then once you've done that, you have it on videotape. So here's an example. It's very informal. Here's an example oh, of one of the kids in our area, perhaps. Eh, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's like seeing it all backwards. Okay. Uh, one good thing about just, just Dance 2 is... Um, the graphics are good. Another one is um, the some of the songs are okay. And one thing that I wouldn't really like about it was um, the it was hard to follow along to. The dance moves are really hard to follow along to. So that's one thing that I would change. Now, wasn't that lovely? He just right there told me something I probably couldn't gotten out of him as I was discussing. He had a chance to think. And then I have him and five of his buddies on video that I can come and show the rest of my developers. Okay? Blogging area, we do ask, especially kids, we ask people to write. And it's not because reading their writing is any good at all, because usually it doesn't help at all. But it helps them start thinking about the issues. That's the beauty of writing. That's why any of us write or journal. So we often ask people some questions, have them write about it, and then we'll follow up in a group discussion or in the video closet and ask the question a slightly different way. They've already been starting to structure their thinking and writing, and then you get richer feedback. Oh, creative development. Okay, so we did a, a project. We were trying to decide um, pirates or ninjas for this cooking game that we did. Um, we had a little bump in the road where they sent us off to do Vikings. But then we came back to, to ninjas. And so we would do things like instead of showing them artwork, we'd say, um, draw a ninja in the kitchen. What dishes is she preparing? Or would say, draw a pirate, draw a superhero with a tool belt and show us what you think is there. I mentioned that earlier about asking users to draw the next level or to forecast. Those creative activities where you ask them to give you ideas is not because you need ideas for your game. You've got plenty of that. It's so that you can hear what they have liked about what they've seen so far. It's a very powerful way to get feedback, to give people a pen and pencil or something to draw on. Okay, uh, Kate touched on this yesterday. Work with users and your gatekeepers. If you're doing kids, you wanna get uh, teachers, parents, plus or minus one. If you are targeting 12 year olds, check it out with 10 year olds and 14 year olds. If you are targeting the male audience between 20 and 30, see what the male and the female audience between 30 and 35 do. Give yourself plus or minus one and you might find you can expand to a larger audience. Okay, don't fix it if it doesn't seem broken. <laughs> I was in my bedroom a while back and I noticed um, the light switch was very dirty, you know, because every time I'd go and I'd hit it. And I sat there for like an hour thinking of all of these ways I could design a better light switch and I could put like some plastic there and it wouldn't get dirty or maybe if we moved it. And then I was sitting there after like an hour and I thought, or I could just take a sponge and wash it also works. This happens in games. You are going to get a lot of feedback in user testing. And I'll tell you, the worst thing about user testing, it hurts a little bit. You get so much feedback and you can't do everything everybody wants to. You don't have to. This is your game. You get to decide what the game is. You take all of that feedback. But if it's just a preference, if somebody says they like red and it's blue, then don't fix it. You are only fixing things that are a problem. So be careful for looking at the things that someone has an opinion on and what is something that really needs to be changed. When you are documenting, this is very difficult, document problems and not solutions. It is very hard to hear, to watch somebody not using that help button and say, we need to make that help button bigger, when maybe that's not the problem. Maybe it's not that the help button needs to be bigger. Maybe it's that at this point in the game, no help is relevant. So just document while you're testing what you observed. Then come back afterwards and talk about solutions. Because you're going to try some of the solutions and they're not going to work. And then you're not going to remember what you were trying to fix in the first place. So document problems when you're writing and taking notes. This is one of our math games called Gate. Part of the math snack suite. Okay. As a team. As a team. As 
as a team decide what information to use and what to ignore. Best case scenario, members of your team are also there for the observations. We don't have a testing group and a development group. The developers are all there watching it. As a team, come back, look at all of your notes, and as a team, decide what's worth fixing. It's just as much their game as it is your game, and it's important to see how everybody processes it. I talked about biases earlier. Everybody on your team is going to see something a different way. So we usually have discussion immediately after. Immediately after. We all go in the hall, we all take our notes, we write it down immediately after. So, user testing doesn't remove design genius. I think user testing builds design intuition. The more you test, the better you are at developing next time. The better you are at anticipating audiences. That's a very powerful thing. I am really getting good at the 12 to 14 year old math learner because I've seen how they respond to games. It also enables others to experience your genius. You might be overlooking something about your brilliant an idea in a game, and if you make just a minor change, you can open that up to a whole new world. And finally, it perfects design genius. There is nothing with your idea that needs to be fixed necessarily. Often, it's just some tweaking to the implementation. If you look at user testing as a way to do check-ins throughout the development process, it will make your final idea that much better and then people will really be able to see the genius you put into it. So that is why I no longer hate it. And I think we have a few minutes. So if you have some questions, I'd be happy to answer or make up an answer. Oh, you're either very sleepy or I was more eloquent than usual. How long should the sessions be when you're doing it? That's an excellent question and it's a horrible answer, which is depends. Okay, so what I find is this is what's important. Take the time you think you need. Are we gonna have a discussion? Are they gonna play through levels? Are we just looking at artwork? And add about half an hour to that at least. Because you're gonna need to have some time to get them comfortable in the space, to meet you, to realize you're not scary. You don't seem scary. Are you scary? Okay, to realize, to get comfortable, to get them to know each other, always have some kind of food. I cannot underestimate the importance of food in eliciting feedback, but not alcohol, that goes too far. Then you get more feedback than is actually helpful. No aguadiente in your testing sessions. <laughs> very bad idea. So add a little bit of time before and after. And I mentioned earlier, try to get a group. There is a problem. We, we use the term called Kleenex users. Kleenex users are the users you use once and then you throw them away. <laughs> so we use a blend of Kleenex users and recurring users. And the nice thing about recurring users is we kind of get a sense for how they are and how representative they are of other people. So we have one girl in our game lab. She's a genius and she always gives us feedback and we're like, yeah, totally ignore that. She's not like a normal kid, but we know that about her. But then we also have this bank of people that we will call in and say, I know you've never seen this game. Can you come in and give us some feedback for it? Did that answer your question? Probably, I don't think you could do it in less than an hour. And probably two hours or more, who has that kind of time? See. Yeah. 
so his question is, when you have prototype art, particularly like wireframes, and you want to do some gesture recognition or you want to do something, you're testing something other than the art. How do you test when the art isn't even really there? That's a very difficult process. And probably you have also seen the same issue when you need to share something with a client, perhaps, and it's hard for them to know what they're looking at that's final and what is placeholder and what is not. So one of the tricks that we'll use is placeholder art we will make black and white intentionally. One of the things I always say to our team is that looks too beautiful. Can you make that graphic look more horrible? Because it looks just nice enough that people think it's final and then you get feedback on that. And you don't need the feedback on that because it's not final. So we make it black and white and I intentionally make them kind of look, make a little worse. So what I would recommend for your wire type, for your wire is one of two things if you're just testing gestures. One, it's perfectly okay to set it up with your users and say, okay, I need to show you something that isn't, it isn't even finished enough. It's so early in development and they will all go, oh, wow. Well. We could see something early. So I need to give you a tutorial about what you're looking at. Here's a wireframe. This is what that guy is going to look like. But for now, he looks here. OK? So let me test you. What is this wireframe? Yes, it's the blue monster. Excellent. So that's one way you can do it, is to give them kind of a primer ahead of time and say, some of the things we're looking at is how you use the tool. That's what I'm looking at today. Okay. We also always emphasize with our users, look, we make this, I love it, it's my baby, but I don't know what it's like to be you, and I need you to help me with that. So we are very upfront. We don't say, we need to find out if you like this artwork, so I'm going to show this to you. But I'll say what is not finished, what we know needs work, and then I'll ask for some suggestions. The other option on your wireframes is just smack a, just smack a, um, a 2D plate. What do you call that? A, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a, a what? A skin, yeah, just put, you know, just put a 2D plate. Just draw it you know, on black and white paper with a smiley face and then just put that texture on top so that they can kind of say, okay, this is that guy who does this, this is the dog that does this other thing and let them test that and let them know the graphics aren't final. We are very forgiving of art. We always think art is the most important thing. Art is the least important thing. Art is great in marketing. It's important in a lot of different things. It's good in the final thing, but for the gaming experience, we are very forgiving of art as users we are. And Darren, where did Darren go? I'm fine if Darren wants to come. Yeah, Darren, I'm fine if you want to come plug in and um, um, are there, do we have time for, I don't know. We, we have time for one more question. Okay. Oh. Uh, there is a very small question. How large is the focus? Again, it depends. I'm really good with that answer. Everything depends. I could have done like a five second presentation, like user testing. It depends. There you go. But how big? It depends on how many observers you have and how much you have to do and how many computers you have for them to use and how much opinion you want. So early stages, you probably need at least six, eight, ten people. I would say that is a minimum because otherwise there's just too small of a user group to be representative at all. But you have more than that, it's hard to take the notes. So we usually aim for 10, 15, 20. Sometimes if we have a longer game, we'll go with 20 and no more than one observer for four people and usually no more than five people in a discussion. So if you have that, break them into two groups. Okay? Yeah. Yes. 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 It's all an act. Mm, no, it's not an act. I am a nice person. Yeah. 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 Yes. How, so how do you get people to be loyal to you without buying their opinions? Yes. Okay. The first thing is to be very upfront with them. And yes, I am a nice person. And I will t but I will tell people, hey, I need you to help me. Now, if something works, that's fine. If it doesn't work, I have to know it. So it, is, it takes a knack to be able to show people that. When you're testing something and they found a flaw and they don't want to show it to you, that's why you can't depend entirely on what they say. You have to depend on what they look like. So I would say first, kind of be upfront with them. Second, use multiple ways of getting feedback so you can see if you observe something or they can design something that you don't hear. And then third, throughout your process, reinforce with them what their role is. Your role is very important. You are a consultant for us. So the work you do is just as important. That means I need to hear the good, but I have got to hear the bad. Please be brutal with me. 
And if you do that, sometimes they take it too much, and that's the stuff you put onto the ignore column. But if you can do that, I think they'll know that you're genuine and not just wanting to hear good things. Thank you. Yes. And I'll, I'll be here. I have another session after, and I'll be here after. So if you all want to grab me after, I'd be happy to chat. I don't want to cut into Darren's time. Let's, let's thank again to Barbara.